To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God be the glory for the things he has done. With his blood he has saved me, with his power he has raised me, to God be the glory for the things he has done. Be seated, please. Scripture reading today comes from Matthew chapter 2. We'll be reading the first 12 verses. If you would like to read in your own Bible, please flip there now. Otherwise, the words will be on the screen behind me. We continue our Advent series talking about Bethlehem. So I have, we have selected a story from Bethlehem about Jesus' birth, and we will be Learning what God has for us today. Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet was, has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then... Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and to go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may too go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. One of the things that's difficult to convey from the pages of Scripture is just how close everything in the promised land is. I have some photos I'm going to show you later, but... Jerusalem and Bethlehem are only about eight miles away. You can walk back and forth probably twice in one day, easily. A lot of things within the pages of Scripture when it's talking about locations and distances feel like they're miles and miles apart. But in reality, they're well within walking distance of a day's trip, maybe only two at most. Even, uh, even Joseph and Mary's journey from Nazareth down to uh, Bethlehem would have taken a couple days if they took their time. Everything is really close. And so when you hear this story, it's easy to lose track of what's happening, where the characters are coming from, and what's going on. But in this story, it's filled with hatred and love. But one of the principal characters, Herod, is a real monster. Absolute travesty of a human being. I'm going to cover that. We're going to talk about who the Magi are, who Herod is. I'm going to give you some ideas where everything is located and where people are coming from. And then hopefully, you can just see some things of kindness from God. So let's start. Who are the Magi? Well, the Magi, or wise men, uh, some of your translation might say, uh, they could have been astrologers, astrologers, astronomers, either one, or even just uh, some sort of uh, mystic of some kind. 
uh, they likely saw the star and there was some association with where the star was, when it appeared, uh, the part of the sky and the season, and all of these things correlated with them realizing that the star was indicating to them that a king of the Jews had been born. And so they set out. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but the wise men did not show up at the night of Jesus' birth. They likely came from modern-day Iran, it's our best guess, about eight to 900 miles of walking. Unlike the eight from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, this would have been a huge journey. We don't know how long it took them. Maybe a couple weeks, months. Maybe it took them a couple years. We're not sure. But at some point, before Jesus turns two, the Magi will show up and kickstart this story. And so you have to imagine at this point, Mary and Joseph had the visit from the shepherds. They've had the commotion from town. And they're just trying to raise this baby. Joseph likely has told Mary about the dream he had to welcome Mary in as his bride and take care of her to name the baby Jesus. They've gone through all of these different things. They circumcised him. And they're just trying to live life. Joseph is likely just trying to make money and care for his family. Uh, Mary is doing uh, what Mary does to raise Jesus. And they're just living their life. Now, who is Herod? Herod is an interesting but evil character within the pages of Scripture. Scotty, will you show that first picture for me? This is a model of a building site called Herodium. I showed the model because I wanted you to get an idea. Uh, to scale, it's obviously significantly bigger than this. This is located maybe three miles from Bethlehem and a little bit further south of Jerusalem. But from its vantage point, Scotty, if you show the next picture, now you can't see this, but I'm going to describe what you're looking at. In the distance on the hilltop in the, in the far side, that's Jerusalem. This is one of Herod's main buildings that he constructed. And from its vantage point, he could see Bethlehem, he could see Jerusalem to the right of that photo. If you were standing where I was when I took this picture, you would see the wilderness that Jesus spent his time in. The wilderness that Jesus spent his time in would have been less than a day's walk from civilization and rest. Like everything is so close in Israel. It's a very small country. And so you can imagine that Herod, when he hears from the Magi, he's likely in Jerusalem. And word spreads, these great wise men, these visitors from afar have come, and they stir up all kinds of conflict. You can take that picture down now, Scotty. They stir up all kinds of conflict because they come in and they say, listen, we're here to worship the king of the Jews who's just been born. Now pause. Who are they saying this to? The current king of the Jews. King Herod is the king of Judah. He is ruling and reigning over this territory. He was appointed by Rome to be in this position of power. And now, here these influential people are showing up. And they're saying, listen, we're here to worship the new king of the Jews. You're old. You've moved on. You're retired. The new king is here. That's likely what Herod is hearing. Now, why is it a problem for Herod? Well, we know a couple things about Herod. One, he was a fantastic architect. He was able to build a natural port by figuring out a way to construct concrete that formed once it was mixed underwater. And he was able to build Caesarea Philippi up to be a harbor. In fact, if you see aerial photos today, you can still see the foundations underwater where it's little dark spots of what he constructed. It was phenomenal craftsmanship. He built all sorts of sites all over the place. Herodium was one of them. The other thing we know is that he was a highly suspicious and paranoid man. We know from history that King Herod murdered his own wife and son because he was afraid that they were going to take away his ruling authority. Now imagine that. Imagine murdering your spouse and your child because they might usurp your throne or your power or your authority. And so when Herod hears this from the Magi, 
he's probably thinking, well, here's another one that I've got to take out. Someone that apparently the heavens themselves declared to be the king of the Jews cannot get in my way of being the king of the Jews. And so the Bible, Matthew telling us that he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him, it's just an interesting sentence. And it's especially interesting that Jerusalem was disturbed with him. It's also interesting that Matthew writes this the way he does. He called together the people's chief priests and teachers of the law. Herod would have only been a Jew in appearances to keep up peace or to continue ruling. He would have likely had no real interest in following the laws of God. And he murdered his own wife and son, probably not following the laws of God. And so he asks them, where is this Messiah supposed to be born, this king of the Jews? And what they do is they cite Micah verses, chapter 5, verses 2 and 4. And I want to actually read them to you from Micah. So I'm going to read verse 2, and then I'm going to read verse 4. I'm going to skip verse 3. But Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And jumping down to verse 4, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will, surely, and they will live securely. From then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. Now, the section they quoted was just a small section, and it feels like, why is the Micah passage so much different than the Matthew one? There's a couple of reasons. Oftentimes, they would actually only quote a short section of text. But when they did that, they wanted to invoke in your mind the whole section of text. I only read two verses. They would have wanted you to have the whole context in mind when they repeated it. They would have included verses 1 and 3, as well as five and onward, maybe even a little bit of four. Everything that is around those two verses that they recited would have come to mind when you invoked these verses. But the key part that they really wanted, to, that Herod wanted to hear was where he was born. So I can imagine that once he hears the child was born in Bethlehem, he no doubt raced to Herodium, climbed to the top, and then just watched the city from afar. Not very afar, only about two miles. But he watched and wondered and waited to hear from the Magi. For their part, they head out to go and see uh, Jesus. And they bring a couple of gifts with them. They bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The Bible tells us that they went out and the star led them on their way. Truthfully, I'm not sure what this means, and most of us don't. Whether it's a miraculous, a light like literally went ahead of them and then stopped a little spotlight over the house or uh, where it was positioned, indicated how it was working. We're not really sure what Matthew is trying to say here. But either way, God led them to Jesus. God directed their steps to his son, where when they found him, they were overjoyed. And when they saw the child with his mother Mary, they bowed down and worshipped him. Now I'm imagining Jesus is like a little over a year old. So I'm picturing Judah at that age. And how he would react if like a couple of strange men came in and all of a sudden bowed down before him to worship him. He'd probably think it was silly. Three-year-old Judah would just kind of laugh. But I can't imagine what Mary's feeling, what Joseph would have been feeling, what uh, Jesus would have been feeling <clears throat> as this is happening. Now, we don't know how many magi are there. We only know that there were three gifts. So we've always kind of assumed there are three magi. Historically, we've assumed three magi. Um, but there could have been more. There could have been a group of people. There could have been the three magi with maybe uh, some like guards or people who came along the way. We're not sure. But either way, this group of people show up and they have gifts to give Jesus. Now, historically, these gifts, uh, we've believed they indicated something. Gold, throughout Scripture, is used to represent divinity. Now, it's typically used in idols, but this gold was likely given to Jesus because of his divinity or his worthiness. 
that he was worthy of being worshipped and being presented with riches. Frankincense is a gum, it's a resin, and it symbolized his righteousness, his holiness, likely his willingness to walk to the cross in the holy life that he was going to live. Myrrh is a spice that's used in the embalming process or the burial process. And historically, we've believed that this symbolized Christ's future suffering. Now, nothing in Scripture really indicates this. I'll fully confess that. We don't know if there are symbolic meanings behind these gifts or if these were the gifts that they brought. I'm inclined to believe the symbolic meaning behind them, uh, but I just wanted to be honest. We just don't know. We don't know for sure. But they give these gifts to Jesus. Now, just look at the contrast between them. Herod hears that there's this king of the Jews. And we know from his character and history, as well as what's literally going to happen next, when he realizes that the Magi have tricked him and just left secretly, that he's going to go on a murderous rampage to kill this one child. He is so full of hatred and self protection. He is determined to make sure that no one is a threat to him and his wealth. Nothing else matters. In fact, I don't have a, I have a picture of this, but I didn't add, give it to Scotty. Outside of the Herodium was where Herod was buried. And there's a model of what that original tomb would have looked like. Today, it's barely any foundation left. Likely, sometime after Herod's death, some people who were looking to fix their houses came and desecrated his tomb, knocking out the stones and taking them back to their own house to build it up. Herod was not respected. He was an evil man who did horrible things. And the remains of his tomb are proof of that. But on the other hand, you have these wise men, these magi who travel for weeks, months, years, for hundreds of miles to see a child. Because they know this child is worthy of their worship and praise. And they go to this tiny town. Today, Bethlehem is actually quite built up. It's like a small city. But then it would have just been a small village. Maybe a couple some families living there, some shepherds in the fields who would have been nearby, taking care of their sheep, guiding them, protecting them from wild animals. It, would have, it, it was a humble small, quaint town. And yet the Magi, who were worthy enough to see the King Herod, were willing to just go and find the child wherever he was. And when they got there, there seemed to have been no question. It's fine that he's in this house, in this small village, in the middle of nowhere. We're going to worship him because he's worthy and we know what we have been told. Herod, on the other hand, wanted to know where Jesus was so he could visit him to kill him, and murder him. One of the interesting theories that I saw posited online is one of the reasons gold may have been given was so that Joseph and Mary could flee with Jesus to Egypt. They could have sold that gold off for supplies to travel and left town. We don't know, because again, the Bible does not say anything, but it seems very possible to protect his son, God made sure that gold was provided and uh, given to him. But this, this story has always been really interesting to me because I've always viewed the Magi as these like superhumans in a sense, where they're just, they know so much and they seem so great. But really in a lot of ways, it just seems like they were just, just people who wanted to come and worship the king and show love to him and if you contrast that with who we know Herod to be, who's only full of hatred and vitriol, the difference is striking. And today, we know people who are like this. We know of people who hear the story of Christianity, they hear the story of the cross, they hear the story of the birth of Jesus, and they just reject it. Whether because they think they've reasoned themselves to believing it's not true, whether they have uh, just think it's all nonsense, or whether they just think, uh, whatever they think, whatever excuse they have, they just reject the story. Self-preservation, self-value, wanting to entertain themselves, do what they want to do, reigns supreme. 
similar to Herod, though I would not suggest that people who reject Christianity are quite as horrific as Herod is. But on the other hand, we know people who hear the story and they come to find Jesus. See, our job is to be the mouthpiece of God. God Himself orchestrated the signaling of the birth of Christ to the people He wanted to hear. The shepherds, who we'll talk about uh, later during Advent, the Magi, these people who are uh, both great and small were asked to come and honor His Son. And they did. Our job now is to continue to put that message out there. Jesus has been born. Come and worship Him. A worthy child has come to take away your sins and make a path to find hope and peace. Come and worship Him. That's our job. And how we can do that, we can invite people, we can be available to them, we can build relationships up with them, whatever it takes. Most of all, pray. But we all know people in our lives who don't know Jesus or their faith has run cold. They're not following God anymore for whatever reason. And we should call out to them and ask them, hey, follow Jesus. Because it's where hope and life is, is at. It's where it's present. We can promise that it's better than the other way. My hope here is that as we read this story, we can just see God's hand through this story where he is guiding these people to honor his son and then to protect his son, to protect Jesus from being killed by Herod. God does similar things for us. But he's also doing similar things in the lives of the people around us. And we just got to pay attention and participate in what God is doing so we can see more people come to know Christ. So my prayer for us this week is that we would all keep our eyes and ears open to see the work of God in the lives of the people around us. And then when God asks us to move, that we would move in faith and in confidence. Let's be the church that glorifies God in this area. Let's be the church and the Christians who will welcome all people in and we go out into our community to bring them to here so that they might worship the Lord with us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give thanks to you for just the kindness that you just show to us. That as we read this story, we see that you, God, are constantly working and moving. You never once just stepped back and let the world do what it wants to do. You've always been guiding us and caring for us. Lord, I pray that you would instill with us a boldness to go. That we would worship God, worship you, and that we would call others around us to come and worship you. Pray that you would give us opportunities to share a faith and that you would move in the hearts of those who hear it and bring them to know your son and to repent of their sins. We pray that your kingdom would grow starting here in this building. We pray that we would be a church that is willing to make that happen. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.